Big Mike here with He's Entertainment. Today's episode, we got an NFL legend and Cincinnati Bengals legend, Jim Breach. Like what we're doing, Bengals fans, hit the subscribe button. Hi, this is Jim Breach, former Bengal all-time league scorer, uh, nominated for the Ring of Honor for the Bengals, and I'll be on the podcast, I Only Touch Greatness. Looking for the most beers on tap, great steaks, great staff, head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks. Chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, sent you. The number one sports podcast in Vancouver with Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. I only touch greatness podcast. He's been in there from the start, as you pointed out, Trump, they've gone to the four-down lineman. Jim Breach ready to try a long-distance hit. This will be a 53-yard field goal attempt with a game tied 7-7 in the second quarter. That wasn't good, but the kick looks to be, if it's far enough, it is. So Jim Breach makes a big leg hit and a great hole by Steve Kreider. A career best for Jim Breach as Steve Kreider somehow salvaged a bad snap to get the ball down right. And that's one of the most important things about field goal kickers, that guy placing the ball. Now, Bre- Playing it safe. See if the Rams use their second timeout to try. For the win, Cincinnati's Breach, 44-yard kick. Only Touch Greatness hey Jim, how you Podcast. Doing? I'm good, how are you? Ryan Hayes and good, Big good. Mike. Big Mike and uh, this is Ryan. Nice to meet you. Hi, hey, Ryan. Nice thank to you, meet you guys. very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time for us today. We really appreciate it. No problems. I'm sorry about uh, earlier today, kind of getting confused on the time. Hey, no, all good. It's all good. It's all, it's all good. It all worked out in the room. In the long run, anyway, so we're happy to have you. Yeah, Mike's a diehard Bengals fan, so he this is, this means the world to him. And me, I'm a Seahawks fan. <laughs> hey, I lost you guys. I don't know what I just did. Okay, I can still see you. I can't see. I I was increasing my volume to hear you better, but are you on your phone? No. Oh no. Uh, I was on the computer. Okay, on the laptop, then it must be in another one of the windows. Probably it'll have a blue little camera, bottom row, across the bottom, almost a blue square with a white camera. No, I kind of lost all that. Um, if you hover your mouse over top of it, it should uh, it should show, the, the say, the window that we are in. Let's see. I don't know what's going on here. You there? Yeah, you're yep. we're still here. Yeah, we can see you. We can see and hear you. Let's see if this does it. There we go. Oh, you got us? Can you see me? Yeah. yeah. Can you see? yeah. I can okay. see you guys now. Oh, okay, good. Too bad you almost, had to, you almost got to go through the interview without having to look at my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was better the other way. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, Jim. I really appreciate the time. Uh, sure. We're just going to ask you a bunch of questions about career, about your career and uh, football. Um, so born in uh, Sacramento, California. Uh, when did you start playing football and how was childhood? I uh, grew up Sacramento was great. You know, it never, it literally never rained in the summertime. I don't remember it raining more, maybe a couple times. So we always had an opportunity to go out and, play sports and whatever season, you know, then it was baseball, a lot of baseball. 
baseball, football, basketball, golf. I played all those. And so football, um, really, we played at the park. Uh, we would play in a league. It was flag football, actually, up and through. Uh, I only played one year of tackle football before I got to high school. Oh, wow. Uh, and then that we were playing flag football through elementary years and then uh, on to junior high school. So, uh, you know, I, one year of tackle football and then on high school. So football was always around, but baseball was really the sport I loved the most at, at that time. Did you have any other hobbies that weren't sports? No, reading. Well, okay. I love to read. Oh, okay. <laughs> but everything was okay. – Everything was pretty much geared around, you know, getting out and playing. We'd get up in the morning and start playing baseball. We, You know, we'd play a pickup game. We'd go and then get over, you know, go grab a bite to eat. We'd come back and either that or hanging out at somebody's house. If it's too hot to go outside, I had oh, yeah. a ping pong table in my garage. So guys would come to my house and we'd play until we were sweating to death. And we'd go into the air conditioning and then we'd go back out. So... Yeah, on those days, it was uh, over 100. We spent a lot of time wow. inside. Yeah. Okay, okay. When did you uh, decide to become a kicker? And uh, how did you become a, How did you become that – or how did you make that decision? You know, I, uh, I always kicked. I don't, I don't know if I ever decided. I was always the guy that did the punts and the kickoffs all through the time we played flag football. Playing flyers up, I, you know, I obviously kicked there. Probably in kickball where uh, the, f the fence was in left field. So you kind of had to do like almost a soccer style kick. And then the Stenerud and your Premier and the Goglak brothers had become popular. And I thought that type of kicking was pretty cool. So I kind of tried to emulate what I was seeing, but really probably pump pass and kick. I don't know if you guys are familiar with pump pass and kick comp. Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got to the 49er training camp one year. I had the longest throw and the longest punt for my age group, and I shanked my place kick because I couldn't decide if I was a straight-on guy or a soccer guy. And I said, this is crazy. I got to pick. So I, yeah, after that, I decided I'm going to kick soccer style. Okay, okay. So I this? lost because of that. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that, Mike? Have you ever seen the clip of Andy Reid when he was a kid and he's like a monster <laughs> Like, he was like 6'3", and everybody else is like 4'11". Yeah. You, you, you he threw the ball that, over yeah. about 60 yards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, there, if you remember a guy by the name of Jared Lorenzen, you mean the really big? Yeah, yeah. he well, passed away, the big area. quarterback. Yeah. And he's from this area, and I was down at the game, and he was the same thing. He came in. He was huge compared to everybody else, and he threw the ball around 60 yards when he was 14. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, if you could sit down for dinner with anyone dead or alive, that's pretty much famous. Uh, who would you choose? Uh, Jesus Christ yeah. would be my first choice. Uh, and then anybody alive. Gosh. I'll tell you, the guy that I would love to is Willie Mays. Willie Mays Great. was... I loved Willie Mays growing up in Northern California. Uh, never have met him. Just loved him as a player. Loved to you know, meet him and just hear some of the stories. Okay. That's a great choice. Both those are great choices. Yeah. Uh, and then you uh, attended the University of California. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, a little bit of a go back to uh, your time there? Well, I, I didn't really think I was going to go to Cal. I was, uh, they talked to me when I was, well, they, they sent a letter or two when I was a junior in high school. And I was all city kicker that year. And then my senior year, I got hurt. So I was only able to kick in three games. I played quarterback also. So I played in those three games, but I, they went to another guy that, okay. and signed a guy out of, out of the Sacramento area also, a guy by the name of Butch Edge. So Butch Edge gets my scholarship, and in the spring, my coach calls down to Cal and said, you know, he's fine. His leg is good. Uh, how about you come back to take a look at him? So Paul Hackett, who uh, became an, an NFL head coach and was at USC and Pitt and different places, 
Hack was recruiting the area, and he came down, watched me kick. Kevin, he, he said, look, I don't know anything. You look pretty good, so come to Cal. <laughs> so I went up to Cal and tried out. I kicked on the field. And uh, a few weeks later, uh, I get a phone call. Well, the baseball draft happened, and I didn't get drafted, which I was disappointed. But Butch Edge was a first-round pick with the Milwaukee Brewers. And Milwaukee didn't want him playing football. So he gave up his scholarship. And sometime in June, I got the call from Cal that uh, we got a scholarship here for you. Because at that time, it was unlimited scholarships. So I was the fifth kicker punter, kicker or punter that they had on full scholarship. Now it's usually the starting kicker, starting punter that have scholarships. So it was a little bit different time. So I go on and uh, my freshman year and kind of puddling along, punting and place kicking in, in two days, not doing either very well. And they said, why don't you go back to junior college? Because that's where I had planned on going. And play, I was going to play baseball and football. And they said, um, I said, no, coach, I don't want to do that. Because in my mind, I knew if I did that, I wouldn't get another opportunity. I didn't think I'd get another opportunity at Cal. So he said, then you have to choose. So I chose between punting and place kicking. There was only one other place kicker. So I figured if, at worst, I'm the second, I'm second team place <laughs> kicker, right? And I said, I'll be, the place, I'll be a place kicker. So it's funny, getting rid of punting and just concentrating my place kicking, my place kicking just took off. And the sixth game, of the, before the sixth game that year, they had a kickoff because the other guy was scuffling. He was really struggling. We had a kickoff. I won the, I won the job and kicked uh, the rest of the way. I like 37 games. So wow, was, that's awesome. Everything happens for a reason, clearly. Yeah, you, know, you never know. Uh, my high school, but one thing is my high school coach, is, he really made it happen. If he doesn't call Cal, I don't get the opportunity. And I can tell you, I would have actually played baseball because the Pirates had offered me a contract as a free agent. And I know if that had been done before I got my scholarship, I'd have taken it in a heartbeat. So I would have ended up playing baseball instead of football. Oh, wow. And out of, cur out of curiosity, the guy that went first round, how did his baseball career end up? Well, interestingly, I end up getting drafted by the Detroit Lions. I got cut by Detroit. And then my agent was Lee Steinberg. And Lee was talking to Al Davis and said, hey, you know, one of the guys I represent just got cut by Detroit. He's a kicker, Jim Breach. And Al said, you know, we liked him because why don't you have him come over? So I came over when I got back and I kicked for him. And Jim Plunkett was there that day and, and Pluck ended up getting signed. And they said, we want to sign you after the end of the year. So I did end up signing the last game of that year, John Madden's last game. So I got to be on the roster with John Madden as a coach. So we go to training camp and go through training camp and I find out I make the team. And in the meantime, Butch Edge drafted by Milwaukee. If you remember when Toronto came in into the league, there was a, a, a expansion draft. Well, the first pick by Toronto was Butch Edge. <laughs> so there's a Canadian connection here, huh? Yeah, so he, yeah. he's, he goes to, can to uh, Toronto, and I find out that I make the team. I come out, they, they cut Earl Mann, who was the kicker previously. And it comes out in the newspaper the next day. It says, Breach House Man for Raider Job. Well, right below it, it says, Blue Jay Rookie wins first pro game. So Butch Edge, the guy that I went to baseball, won his first game the same day I Won my first job. So wow. it's pretty cool. He beat the A's. That is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. That's an awesome story. Do you ever uh, have have beers and have a story with him one day? I've never, ta I've never talked to him. I, oh, really? I played against him. He threw – I played against several guys that pitched in the majors. He threw way – he threw much harder than anybody I faced. I've, Randy Lurch and Pete Redfern and a couple other guys threw really hard. Butch Edge was – throwing BBs. Oh. <laughs> and then oh. you ended up in your home uh, playing for the Bengals, where you played the rest of your career. Yeah, it's kind of funny. You never, you never know how things – so I was so I live in married student housing 
the year I played for the, the year I ended up playing, I played one year in 79 for the Raiders. And I'm living in married student housing because Cal's only 20 minutes away. If I got cut, I was going to go back and finish school, but I didn't get cut. So I just stayed in the married student housing. We got kicked out after the quarter ended. <laughs> but it was okay. You know, I got through that year paying 100 bucks a month in rent. Um, so, you know, it worked out. And then I got cut, I got cut in 1980 off of the uh, Bengals, the Raiders team. Uh, actually, Chris Barr got cut here. Chris Barr was loved by the yep. Raiders. One thing about the Raiders and growing up and following them, I loved them and the 49ers both, different different leagues and then different conferences. Uh, they, when they liked the guy, if he ever became available, you knew he was going to, he's going to end up a Raider. And I knew that they'd missed him in the draft. They wanted to take him in the second round and they decided to opt for the third round while the Bengals grabbed him in the second round. Can you imagine taking a kicker in the second round today? <laughs> oh my gosh. Guys are getting killed, right? Yeah. Aguayo a couple of years ago when they traded, Tampa traded up for yeah. a while. Yeah. That didn't go well. Yeah, so anyway, we're uh, arena arena football league maybe or something. I don't even know where he if he plays football anymore. Oh, I don't know. He's on somebody's practice squad. Oh, is right he? Okay, now, I think. So <clears throat> Chris Barr gets cut there, and I'm thinking I'm done. And sure enough, I was done. Uh, I get called into Tom Flory's first year. I get called into his office, and he says, "Look, we decided to make a change. It has nothing to do with your kicking, but uh, we decided to make a change." And then, my, and then I went into the special team, uh, special team coach's office, Steve Ortmeyer, and he says, this is the most unfair decision I've ever heard. It's not right, but it's Tom's decision. So, uh, which actually I didn't know was Tom's decision there. I thought actually Al Davis's decision. So anyway, I'm out, I'm out of job. And it turns out Chris Barr is in a, in a car driving up and down the street outside the facility waiting for me to leave. It was kind of a weird deal. So I left and, you know, I missed that the rest of that season until the last four games. Uh, I ended up signing with the Bengals and the Raiders go on and win the Super Bowl. They beat Philadelphia and my roommate was Jim Plunkett and Plunk ends up winning the MVP, which was phenomenal. I mean, he's just well, well deserved. He, he was unbelievable. So I was out of a job for a while and then the Bengals call me and that's how I ended up in Cincinnati. And you, uh, you got lucky enough to play in two Super Bowls, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we were on the losing uh, side both times. We were playing uh, the 49ers, and Joe Montana and Bill Walsh were like our kryptonite. No matter what we did, we couldn't beat them. And we had opportunities. I mean, other times, and you know, both Super Bowls, we probably should have won, but you know, they found ways to, to win the games. Just give them credit. Yeah, no. The one Super Bowl, I think it was like three minutes and 51 seconds. I think we had a lead. You had just kicked a field goal, and we had a 16 to 13 lead. And then Montana, I think, drove 92 yards for a touchdown. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for the it, reminder. It, it hurt me too, Jim. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Actually, after I kicked the field goal, put us up by three, uh, I come off the field, and Chris Collins comes up and gives me a high five. Well, and his – actually, for me, it was – high five for me, it was a low five for him because he's 6'5", yeah. you know, 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> he says, too much time for 16. I said, ah, I think you're right. So, unfortunately, that was the case. But the funny thing is, we get done with the game. I'm in the locker room, and uh, John Murdo was the – he was the office manager – or the uh, business manager for the Bengals. He comes up to me and he says, just want to let you know, after you kick that field goal – Sport Magazine did their – they do an MVP early every year. They pick their MVP or they did a preliminary MVP. So with three minutes to go in the Super Bowl, I was the MVP. When the game was over, it was Jerry Rice, and we weren't winning, and Jerry Rice and Joe Montana were just unbelievable. You got to figure yeah. it took Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, and Bill Walsh, take them 92 yards and beat us. Yeah, yeah. Very unfortunate. I mean, yeah, if, if we want to talk about my shitty experience, there you go. At least, yeah, let's change subjects and how about the Seahawks <laughs> not, not running the ball. <laughs> you, you know, I don't have any problem with that, with throwing it, but because of Russell Wilson's legs, 
Yeah. Wouldn't you think you'd get him out, just get him outside the pocket and kind of force him to make a decision whether you're going to come up and tackle him or go ahead and let him throw the ball? I, I think I'd get him out on the edge and let him run a little bit. Yeah, that I agree. Be, I agree. A, a quick little screen pass there, what if maybe to Marshawn hit the far left corner. Yeah, I don't know about a screen pass on the one yard line. That's kind of a weird call. Yeah, yeah that's sketchy. That's sketchy. But apparently, <laughs> they had not been good at goal line that year and scoring from the goal line. So that's why they had to come up with some different plays. And um, the guy that just retired from New England, I don't know what his name is. He's the guy that went through film and showed that the Bill Belichick, that uh, play that they ran, yeah, the slant. And he and said, you got to be ready for this down, down close to the goal line. And so that's why they, get, they were ready for it. Cause typically, and they, had actually, they actually had ran that same play earlier in the game and got, and got the touchdown, I believe. And then uh, – that's where they went to run the same play again and it got picked off. Okay. Or it was actually they ran that play earlier in the season, I think. Is that's where really. that's where the guy saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And what a I mean, what a great play. Yeah, Unbelievable smart. that he hung on to the ball. How did he catch the ball? Yeah. I mean, it, it bounced off his shoulder pad and he somehow yeah. hung on to it. Yeah, Melvin Butler. I mean great players make great plays at big times, yeah. you know. That's for sure. Absolutely. Hey, over the years, did you ever collect anything or like favorite piece of memorabilia? You know, one of my regrets is I didn't get more stuff. I didn't take more pictures. I didn't share stuff. I Man, I, I was always, I always grew up. He just, and even, I don't even have my Super Bowl jerseys. And I'm wow. thinking back, I was always the guy, I took his stuff off, did what you're supposed to do with it. And, should have kept both those jerseys after those games. And no, I didn't do it. I have quite a bit of memorabilia, but not like some people have. I mean, just, just never thought I, it was more playing the game to me was what it was all about. It wasn't so much, but now the memories that those things bring would, would have been pretty cool. Uh, what's it like being nominated uh, for the Bengals ring of honor? Uh, great honor. It was very humbling. You know, we've had some phenomenal players come through here, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate we only have one in the Hall of Fame besides Paul Brown with Anthony Munoz. And we've had some great teams. I mean, we have two teams that went to Super Bowls. Through the 80s, you know, our, we had offenses that were just dominating. In the 70s, here's an expansion team that in three years, when expansion teams got nothing, they literally got nothing. And they had like 150 people in training camp the first year because they had no they had no players. So yeah. you just got to figure out what you can find. And they had them in the playoffs in two or three years. Paul Brown did. Some great players in the 70s. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the 80s, our Super Bowl years. So, you know, it's unfortunate that more guys haven't been recognized. Ken Riley – Fifth all-time in interceptions, never makes a Pro Bowl, really. Led the league two or three times, or at least tied for it a couple times. You know, Lamar Parrish, several All-Pros, or several Pro Bowls. He's yeah. not, and he had 47 interceptions. Yourself, you know, you Kenny Anderson. Sides. Yeah, great yeah. defenses. So, yeah. you know, you throw that out there and now with the Ring of Honor, and I think people have been clamoring for it, clamoring for, it for quite a Quite a few number, quite a number of years. I know. Just talking to people at different times, they like having. I think it's the memories. You know, you ask about yep. what kind of things do I have, and that's we're kind of we're creating memories, right? When you play, you're creating memories, and I have memories from when I went to games with my dad, my brother. You know, memories of my kids going to stuff or going to their games. Yeah, and that's all we're doing is create memories when we play and. So we have a lot of people have a lot of memories and they want to, they want to say thank you to those guys. And now they get an opportunity to do that. And it's kind of, it's fun and it's pretty amazing to be on that list. And if my stats are correct, I believe you still have two records as well. I know you have the Bengals record with a thousand one hundred and fifty one points. And I believe you have a nine for nine NFL overtime record. I do. Yeah, that was, you know, I missed a couple of kicks Early on, not in the, 
I missed one in college my freshman year, and then I missed one the year with the Raiders at the tie a game. And I kind of spent some time thinking about why I was missing because I wasn't, I wasn't nervous. And I realized I was trying to control things I had no control over. I was worried about what you might be thinking or what one of my teammates might think or the fans or what they're going to write about. All these things going through my mind that you have, I have no control over, right? So when it finally dawned on me that, hey, dummy, you can control the kick and that's all you can control. I can't control the blocking up front, the snap or the hold, the kick itself. After that, everything took off. I mean, it was literally like the focus got so honed in. The game was in slow motion on those game winners. So I got, I got pretty good at uh, big kicks. Reggie Williams pulled me aside early on. He says, if you really want to gain respect of the players in the locker room, make the kicks that are important. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do my best. And it turned out, it turned out really well that way. But, you know, I uh, led the league and led the AFC in scoring a couple times. When I retired, I was the 10th leading scorer in NFL history. Hey, here's, a, here's an interesting little note. When I was done, there were more guys with 3,000 hits in baseball than there were players with 1,000 points in the NFL. Wow. That's not the case now. These kickers today are unbelievable. Yeah. You know, just like baseball has gone kind of crazy, so has uh, football and you know, all the preparation, all, all the stuff they do, all the analytics – they go into it and the dietary stuff. I mean, steak was kind of our what we were supposed to have. You know? <laughs> now they rarely have steak. Oh, I'm craving a steak right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're not going to go out and play in a few hours after eating it, most likely. Yeah. Um, what would your dream for some of golf be? Wow. Oh, that's a good one. You know, um, <clears throat> I think my dad. Gosh, you got me on that one. Yeah. You know, my dad, a couple of my kids, I think just go play someplace really cool. Uh, if you went to a high level, like maybe that's around cool. with Tiger. Um, yeah, Tiger would be sweet. <laughs> Tiger, would be, it'd be interesting. He, and he went to Stanford. I went to Cal, so I don't know if I can do that. You know, that's. <laughs> I don't know, you know, again, I haven't thought about those types of things. You know, what, what would a dream foursome be? Gosh, I mean, just whoever the other three guys, I'm happy to go play golf. You know, yeah, exactly. give me a great place. I'd love to go play. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> One of my best friends was the Cal golf coach, Steve Desimone. And he was there for 37 years. And we used to play, when I was in college, we used to play every Friday. And Des was talking about going to play Cypress Point. And hopefully that's still going to happen. Going to play Cypress would be unbelievable. You know, that would be just, cool. Yeah. Right, Grab awesome. Anthony Munoz. He's my golf buddy. So get Anthony. We go out there, Steve. Get with, with Des. And he could bring somebody. And we go play there. Maybe go over and play Pebble Beach. And. There's there my uh, there's there's my Anthony Munoz ball right there. Yeah. Oh, he loves to play some golf. Here. Um uh, what did you guys what did you think of the Bengals fifth round pick this year uh, with Evan McPherson kicker? I really liked it. You know, they've got people get into these again, the analytics of football and all the other sports. But if you don't take the guy you really want. And you end up losing a game because you have somebody you didn't want because the guy you really wanted was going to be drafted and end up going later in the draft when you're supposed to go. Why don't you take the guy you want? And that's what yep. they did. You know, Randy Bullock's done a nice job for a few years. They didn't keep Jake Elliott a few years ago because Randy actually outkicked him. But Jake's mm -hmm. had a really nice career in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. uh, Randy will go to Detroit, and I'm sure he'll do a great job. But they got the guy they wanted this year, and so I was excited for him. He's a have a little co correspondence with him. Nice kid. He'll do a great job. Really excited for him. I think we did. I think the Bengals did well in the draft overall, completely. I, I mean, uh, getting Jamar Chase and uh, 
having that LSU connection. And then the week before they had signed uh, Thaddeus Moss, which is uh, little, little Randy or Ra- Randy's kid. And he, him and Burrow were unreal in college. So it's going to be nice to see if they have a connection right. as well. Sewell or Chase, which were you? Oh, I was going Chase. I was telling Ryan before the draft, Chase is the Chase was who I wanted. My heart was saying that we were going to go Sewell. So initially, I thought we should go Sewell, but then AJ leaving, I thought I thought we were lacking in depth at wide receiver, mm-hmm. and and then you hear Zach Taylor say that the best player at wide receiver he's ever uh, scouted was Jamar Chase. Well, interestingly. Marvin Lewis said the best wide receiver he'd ever scouted was A.J. Green. So here is one guy replacing another guy. And I think that can make unbelievable difference to the offense. So oh, yeah. what do you do? You, what do you do in the second round? You pick a guy that nobody seems to have ever heard of except in Cincinnati because he's, he's from Cincinnati. He went to high school here. And yet you watch him on film. I don't, I'm sure you've probably watched a little bit. Yep. Guy, he's a player. Yeah, he's he, a beast. He just knocks. I mean, he's just knocking people down. So you move in inside the guard because you know, really, Burrow got hurt on plays up the middle. Dalton's had that problem when the Bengals have had issues with their offensive line. Even with, the, if you don't feel like the tackles are with as good as they should be, it seems like the push up front gets in the quarterback's face a lot more. And and you know, the New York Giants beat Brady by getting in his face, pushing in the front. So. If if uh, Jackson Carmen can stop those guys from from uh, you know moving him back and allowing a pocket to form, Joe Burrow is going to be great. So I'm I think we have one of the me too, and I think we have one of the deepest wide receiver corps out there right now. I mean, when you add Jamar Chase and you got T Higgins, you got Boyd. I I, I really like Auden Tate too. I think uh, that guy's got some good hands. He just never had a chance really. He he uh he makes unbelievably spectacular catches. He's he's incredible. So yeah, you can throw the ball his way. He goes up and get Mike Thomas is a good receiver. Yep. And I think they think Stanley Morgan can be a good receiver. He's an unbelievable special teamer. I think he's got some ability too. So yeah, they're getting depth, but the first three are gonna be as good as the NFL has. I agree. Growing up, what was your favorite sports franchise? Well, in football, it was the Raiders and the <clears throat> excuse me. So it was the Raiders in football, and then the 49ers. And in baseball, it was the Giants and then the A's. But I loved them both again because oh, different Bay conferences, Area. different leagues. I could root for both of them. I I didn't think because today it seems like people will pick one or the other. Why can't I root for both of them? You know, I was a big fan. I, Willie Mays was my guy. I loved. Love the Giants. The A's won three World Series in a row when I was in high school. So I got to see them both play a lot. It was it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. So those those are my teams and the Raiders and the as I said, the Raiders and 49ers. Uh, growing up, I just uh, I loved them. I was back in the Dennis Eckerly days. Is that the right name? No, he wasn't. No, not then. It was before that. It was back in the 70s. Oh, okay, the mid 70s. Yeah. I'm, I'm old. I'm old. It was Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando, Catfish Hunter. Um, yep. Those teams were, were phenomenal. They, they beat the A. The Reds actually were a team that they beat. But they won three World Series in a row with just unbelievable pitching and really clutch hitting. So, you know, it was, it was great. We had really good teams. Sacramento, where I grew up, didn't have any pro sports. And I really, I don't know, if you grew up, if, you have, if you've never had pro sports, you don't know what you're missing until you're in a city that has it. And, and it really makes a difference. It's fun, particularly for somebody who likes sports. And somebody doesn't like sports, they wouldn't care. Oh, one yeah. the other, but I cared. You know, <laughs> so yeah, I had to go to the Bay Area to go see a professional game. Now, Sacramento's got the Kings, and they have the minor league affiliate for the A's. Yep. So they have uh, they do real well. And they've got a uh, – MS. Uh, MLS team too now. Oh yeah, the soccer. Daddy has one. What's that? Okay. Soccer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course Vancouver does as well. Right. Yeah, Jim. Was, I think Jim was the one. The worst the I think last Jim, two years. I think yeah. Jim, you were the one telling me too that uh, you've been out to Vancouver, right? 
went to Vancouver a couple of years ago. So we've got some, some a buddy of mine in his line of work. He beats a lot of different people. So he met a bunch of guys from Canada. Chris Hebb. Are you familiar with Chris Hebb? The name? No. He's in the basketball, the Canadian Basketball Hall of Fame. He ran, what was the uh, network that had the Toronto basketball, baseball, football? Uh, Rogers. Yeah, he ran that a few years ago. And oh, then they wow. changed his hands and he's not there any longer. So, or, or is uh, it Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment? They play sports or Rogers sports, one of the two. Rock yeah, it was one of those. He ran that for a long time. Oh, okay. And then they, he, now he's a commissioner of one of the youth leagues, one of the upper okay. echelon youth leagues in hockey. So we get together, and every every two years we'll go back and forth. And to a couple of years, well, four years ago now, we were in Vancouver. Went up to the mountains where they have the had the Olympics. Yep. Stayed yep. there Wixler. on some of the facilities they have there, and we golfed up in the mountains, and it was just spectacular, yeah. absolutely spectacular. And Vancouver is a gorgeous city. I was, I was blown away. It's just, it's fantastic. Yeah, that's it, nice we, to hear. Yeah, it is. We love it here, of course. A little it's beautiful. A little expensive. Should. Yeah, a little expensive to live here, being a. Such a beautiful place. But well, you're they, like you're like Sac San Francisco of of the West Coast, right? Yeah, for, for the U.S. Yeah. It's pretty expensive in San Francisco too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, did you have any rituals when you played or routines you had to do on game days? You know, I I kind of went out of my way not to do that because I didn't. It was bad enough being a kicker. People <laughs> thought you. Everybody was a bunch of flakes. So I try. It's kind of like the goal. It's kind of like, like, goal, like the goalie of hockey, right? The kicker, the yes. football, goalie of hockey. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> and and the unfortunate thing is, we did have some crazy guys. You do have some guys, guys like that to give you a bad reputation. So, uh, I didn't. But the one thing I learned the last six years of my career, I started going over with the offensive lineman right after breakfast, and I found that it would get me loosened up and. I I do my stretching, go out on the field, and I really liked that time. It was kind of a real peaceful time. There was, you know, no urgency at that time. Go out and hit a few balls, and to see how you're hitting them that day, even before you go out for warm ups. Because once warm ups start, you have a few kicks, and then team comes out, and you know this one was more where you could just kind of relax, go out, enjoy it, interact with some of the other team guys you might know on the other team. It was a great time. I wish I had done it my whole career. It just was a great time. It's this peaceful time before you played the game. So that was one thing I really, really enjoyed doing. And I actually got loosened up better and got a good sweat going, which two hours before the game, it seemed like, especially on cooler days, was harder. And as I got older, I needed, I needed that extra time. <laughs> what was your favorite road stadium you played in? Anything with a dome was good. <laughs> You're a kicker, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. The, the, probably the worst place to play was Cleveland. And I think I went like 18 for 19 on field goals in Cleveland. And it was windy and the grass was terrible. And, and the, the fans are on you. Old. What's that? And the fans are all over you. Yeah. The, the nice thing there is the fans were – because it was really a baseball f stadium – at the old the old municipal stadium, so the yep. fans would yep. kind of back away from you. So it really wasn't as much of an issue until you got down by the dog pound, <laughs> and they go nuts. So yeah, that um, so Cleveland it was always fun because there was so much history there. I mean, all those great teams that Cleveland had, but their locker room, wherever whatever room you're in right now, that the locker room was about that big, and that maybe a little bit bigger. It, they, <laughs> were, they were small. So, wow. So Cleveland was tough to go to, but yeah, and anywhere, and a lot of times going out to places that are warm. Warm weather was nice to kick in. Dal Dallas actually might have been the best place to kick with that hole in the roof. Yeah, okay. yep. that heat would rise and seemed like the ball just—it was almost seemed like it was unfair kicking there because the ball just flew. What was your longest? Fifty-three. Okay. Fifty-three okay. against the Jets. 
And then I had a preseason 53-yarder against the Bears. So I got you a question the, for you, Mike. Yeah. How did you become a Bengals fan? Uh, my dad, uh, I was born basically with a Boomer Esiason jersey. My dad gave me a Boomer Esiason jersey when I was a little kid, and uh, I just stuck with it. So how did your dad become a Bengals fan? Uh, was he, he a, a Bengals Boomer fan? And, no, he's a, he was a Bengals fan and Dolphins fan. He's still a Dolphins fan, and now he's a Seahawks fan, but he kind of left the Bengals for me now, so. <laughs> I got like cups. I got cups from like 1989 and the original season from the Bengals. Like I, I've collected. I, I got everything. I'm a huge, huge collector of the Bengals stuff. That's crazy. It, it, I always find it interesting because uh, I went to, to Iraq back in 04 and we would go around and as we're signing autographs, people coming through and you ask where they're from. And, you know, there's people all over the, all over the world say, Oh yeah, I root for the Bengals. And, it's like, why? You know, why would you pick that? And it's kind of, I just think it's interesting, you know? I mean, you latch yep. on, maybe it's the colors, the helmet, who knows? Who knows why somebody decides to, to root for a team? But I always am impressed that people stick with it. Those you know, new jerseys are thin, sweet. It's been too. a lot thin. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But the I 90s agree were not real pretty. Although no, you were really young I'm, in the 90s, right? Yeah. Was, yeah. It was even born in the 90s. Yes, yeah, I, so was. That's good. I was. I was born in the eighties. To... Bullshit! I was yeah. born in the eighties. <laughs> so yeah. full of it. I mean, as you were saying that, how you somehow end up with the team that you cheer for? It's like I grew up my whole life uh, watching those 49ers in the Montana era, and I was always a 49ers fan. But then when I started getting money, and Seattle's only two hour to drive, so we were going to Seahawks games. But my games that I would go to would always be 49ers. So I could see the 49ers, but then I sure. slowly and slowly, and I was always too chicken shit to wear a 49ers jersey in a, a road stadium, so uh, or in the home stadium. So then I got there, and I was always a Seahawks fan, and I slowly got going. Well, now I'm going to multiple games a year, and <laughs> still the 49ers games. I'll always go to the 49ers games. Part of the I was 12, uh, huh? Yeah. yeah. I was all decked out and I went to a Bengal. It was only a preseason game too, Bengals and Seahawks. And uh, man, people were throwing fucking popcorn at me. And we, we were killing them that game though. Like it was, it was a preseason game, but it was probably like 40 to 13 or something. I wasn't even cheering, but they just were not happy. <clears throat> that's interesting. It's, that's a whole different story about fandom and the way people react and how crazy that can be. I don't know, yeah, you can all be from the you can all be from the same city and have total hatred for somebody just over a t- team that they cheer for. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they don't like it. Fans don't like it when a player goes from like the Boston Red Sox to the New York Yankees or something like that. that yep. Fans don't like it, but you know, when you're a player, yeah, you didn't like that team, but if they're the ones that's going to pay you, then yeah. Probably how you're going to end up there. Yeah, go get that money. Can yeah. you uh, give us a Can you give us a good Kenny Anderson or uh, Muno story? So K A Kenny uh, Kenny was my holder for one year, 1986, and he was terrible. <laughs> But somehow we made all the kicks. And we're playing in Cleveland on a Thursday night game. And, well, let's, let's back up. It's like first, second or third game of the year. We've got an extra point. And he says, Breach, I don't care where this snap is. I'm putting it down. We don't do any kind of – we don't run with the ball. We don't fake the ball. We don't do any of that. You're kicking it. So he got a high snap. He, he slams it on the ground. We make it. We end up kicking it. So we got an overtime. We're going into overtime. And he's standing there over next to, to Sam White. And Sam says, okay, should we uh, – because Boomer – I think Boomer – yeah, Boomer was in. This was 80, 86. He says, okay, what do you think? Should we uh, kick it? He goes <laughs> – no, no, you got to go. You, we need to go for it. We need to score a touchdown. <laughs> and uh, he says, after the game, we go out, we end up kicking the game, kicking the uh, overtime field goal, win the game. He goes, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to do that. I, 
I wanted the touchdown score. I didn't want to handle that ball and screw it up on the, on the snap or something. He hated it. He said that was the hardest job he ever had. He hated it. <laughs> so we're in Cleveland, and he gets a high snap, a little bit of a high snap. And I told him, don't put it down so hard. And he's like, what do you want me to do? So he puts it down. And I'll tell you what, it's like he's trying to drill it into the ground. <laughs> and somehow I make it. It was a 49-yarder, and it went through. And to this day, if you ask, he goes, how many did we miss? No, we didn't miss any. But it was, it was unbelievable. K, but K.A. Was, was an amazing player, should be in the Hall of Fame. We're playing a Monday night game against Pittsburgh, and he drops back to pass in the end zone. Keith Gary grabs him by the face mask and completely turns his head around. So his name is here. His head is looking back oh. where his jersey name is. And that was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It was so he had all kinds of back. I think he may sell some back issues from that. I would, I would he, would, so. he missed quite a bit of that season. <laughs> it was nasty. It was that unbelievable. Is nasty. But K, you know, KA that eighty-one season comes in first game throws three interceptions in the first quarter, gets benched. I think one of them gets run back for a touchdown. Kirk Turk Schoner comes in, leads us to a win, come back win. We were down 21 nothing. We ended up winning 27-21. And Forrest Gregg is going to start Turk the next week. And Kenny goes in and has a long meeting with, with uh, Forrest Gregg and says, Coach, look, give me one more chance. So when we go to New York, we get down 14 to nothing. We end up coming back, and we win 31-30. And Kenny goes on, wins the MVP of the league that year. So yep. one of those things, you never know, right? I mean, the little things, stuff happens for a reason. He bounced back from that first game and ends up being the, having just a phenomenal year. It's okay, but yeah, he should, he should definitely be in the Hall of Fame. He lead the league in passing two different times in two different decades, had the record for completion percentage. I mean, there's so many things he did playing the Steelers in the 70s. He had a bear passer rating like – 30 points higher than the league did in the league. And he, and he had to play him twice a year. So yeah, Kenny Anderson is awesome. Anthony loved to play golf. So, you know, that's my golf buddy. So we're playing Cleveland and we need to win this game. If we win and Pittsburgh loses, we go in the last game of the year. If they are, if they go, they got to go out to Oakland and play the Raiders who were really good. If they go out there and lose, and we win against Cleveland and win the next week. We're in the playoffs. So we have to win this game. Kenny Anderson's down. Is, this is 84. He's, he, he's, out, he's out of the game. Turk start, starts. And our third-string quarterback is Boomer Esiason. The Boomer's moved out, elevated to, to second string, right? In the first quarter, Turk gets his shoulder separated. Chris Collinsworth gets knocked out. They're out of the game. Boomer comes in. No clue. He's running around like a madman. And usually he just threw the ball to Collinsworth because he was 6'5". He's not in the game. And somehow we come down. We're, we're down. Let's see. We were down uh, 17. We were down 10 points. And we drive down to like the three-yard line, throw three passes. They all should have been intercepted. None of them get intercepted. So we decided to kick a field goal. So we kicked the field goal. Now we're down. 20 to 13, they get the ball. They have to punt. We block the punt. We drive down. We're on the one yard, one or two yard line. We're down seven. There's five seconds. The last play of the game. There's like three seconds, four seconds. I can't remember what there was left. Last play of the game. What do they call tackle eligible? This is your season. And you, and the, who do you call, throw it to? You throw it to your tackle. And they had a play where Boomer would roll out, or the quarterback would roll out to the right. Anthony would come off. But the problem was Boomer's left-handed. So he actually <laughs> literally has to come and twist his body around, throws a pass. Anthony makes a diving catch in the end zone. We kick the extra point to tie the game. They get the ball first in overtime. 
We get a big punt return. I kick the field goal. We win the game. We go in. We go into the locker room. Everybody's going all fired up. We were down <laughs> quite a bit at one point. Yeah. And there's Turk yeah. and Chris in there watching Soul Train. Because <laughs> I couldn't get, I couldn't get the game on TV. They couldn't believe we won. They were shocked. And so, uh, interestingly, that's <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> So that week, there was a kid I recruited at Cal by the name of Joe Cooper. Kicked in a handful of games in the NFL. He was kicking for Houston. Houston was playing Pittsburgh. So I kicked in the overtime field goal, win the game. He kicks for Houston. He kicks an overtime field goal to beat Pittsburgh. So now we're there. We, if we win the last game and Pittsburgh goes to Oakland and loses, I can't remember who we played. We blew them out. Oakland doesn't, they're in the playoffs already. They don't play anybody. Pittsburgh ends up winning. And we come into the – we come in for our, like, a exit t- thing the next day, and Pat McAnally is like, I can't believe it, Breach. You told me Oakland was going to beat Pittsburgh. I can't believe I'm so mad at you. Like, <laughs> like I didn't want to go to the playoffs. It wasn't my fault. Like, yeah. No control on what Oakland did. <laughs> <laughs> That's but Anthony, awesome. Anthony was unbelievable. Literally, so here's – Here's who you're playing. So you put, you got your offensive line, and then you got the guys over there. So they would go and they just erase Anthony's guy. So we don't have to worry about that guy. We just have to worry about these guys over here. Literally, that's what they did. They put it on I the board, it. and he'd erase his name because his guy wasn't going to be. He wasn't going to have anything to do with impacting the game, and that's what he <laughs> did for 13 years. He was yep. the most gifted. I mean, his, I never saw him off balance. Nothing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He is. He was. He still is. Yep. Um, I was going to hit you with, uh, what, what's one word you want to uh, tell the Bengals fans? What's one thing you want to tell the Bengals fans? To stick with them. Persevere. You know, I think, I think there's good things going to happen. Uh, Joe Burrow is the real deal. He's just, he's unbelievable. They're doing, they're putting together some great things. You know, you talk about the draft. I was really happy with the draft from the standpoint that they went defensive line, offensive line. Because mm-hmm. one of the, if you remember last year, some of the big issues came when G, DJ Reader gets hurt and uh, Rennell mm-hmm. Wren gets hurt and Josh Tupoy, they don't play. He, he sits out. They didn't have any defensive linemen. And that became an issue. They didn't have any depth. So they're starting to put really good depth together because everybody gets hurt, right? But you got to have some depth. And that's what they have. Absolutely. Starting to get some depth on both sides of the ball. So I'm encouraged. The biggest thing, though, is Cleveland is going to be a bear. We know Baltimore is really good. I think the Bengals, I think Pittsburgh are going to struggle a little bit this year. I hope. I agree. They they do, at least. And uh, the Bengals picking up. Pittsburgh's uh, taking that division for sure. What's that? I don't think so. Pittsburgh's taking that division for sure. Next year? This yeah, year? I think so. How much do you want to bet? <laughs> Najee Harris. <laughs> They're not winning the division. No. They will not win the division. Now, no, they, they so. might beat the Bengals. That's possible. I think that division is becoming what the NFC West has, has been. It's, it's, it, the division is going to be unbelievable. But I don't think the Steelers – I don't think they're going to be as good as they've been in the past. I think – They'll be better than they were those last few games of the year. But I, I, I think they're – I don't think – I don't know Ben's what he was. Uh, no. Nope. I just don't – I don't think they're quite what they were. They do have a great defense, though. Yeah. They do. And I think the Bengals picking up Riley Reef uh, will help big time, too, on the line. I mean, he's he's a huge addition for Burrow. I agree. And they, and they need to do something up, up in the middle there. And uh, Jackson Carmen uh, is going to be huge. For helping there, and then Quentin Spain, who um, they picked up. Hopefully, you know he can he can play from the now he gets to start from the beginning of the season. If if uh, Trey Hopkins comes back healthy, the offensive line could be pretty decent. I agree. Hey Jim, I just want to uh, thank you very much uh, for taking the time for us today and coming on. We really appreciate it. As you know, I'm a huge Bengals fan, a huge fan of yours, so it meant a lot to me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. Thank Thanks, you. Ryan. Great to yeah, talk th- with th- you guys. Th- thank you again for taking the time for us. And uh, 
We we really appreciate it, and I know Mike really loves his Bengals. So cool. So that guy right above your head is pretty good, isn't he? Yeah, DK Thought about Metcalf. Yeah, Man, DK Metcalf. What, he's a he's a beast. Yeah, he Gosh, is. Gosh, is he good? And as soon as good. as soon as uh, during the draft, I was watching, and he, they kept the Seahawks kept moving back, and I'm like, grab DK. I wanted to take DK in the first round. And then they move back, and they move back again, and they move back again. I'm like, every time I was screaming at my TV, but they still got him, and everything worked out. I'd say. Yeah, he's <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah, that's for sure. Player. If you're looking for a mug, perhaps a hoodie, head on over to I only touch greatness.com. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great steaks, great staff. Head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, sent you.